so hello everyone and thank you all for joining our women in surgery panel discussion today organized by the british indian surgical association bisa uh, which is a surgical wing of bima um, so a bit about bima and bisa we're a society formed in august last year with the aim to support all medical professionals both academically and professionally um, whilst providing a voice for british indian medical students nationally so in terms of the team, uh, my name is Sonam and I'm a fifth year medical student at UCL um, and I'm BEMA Vice President. On the panel, we also have Sarika, who is academic lead and Anisha, who is secretary and networking and careers lead and they're both medical students at KCL. And then behind the scenes, we have Amar, who is at Imperial and he's BEMA President. Um, and we have Siddharth, who is founder of BISA and Vice President and he's at KCL. So today we're hosting a women in surgery event because around 58% of, pe of people accepted onto study medicine are women. However, this translates to only 11% of women reaching consultant positions in surgery. So we believe it's important to have a discussion with female surgeons to find out more about their experiences and some of the barriers that may exist and what we can do to overcome them. Um, I personally, throughout my time at medical school, have attended and organized various women in surgery conferences and events and have, fo and have found them really insightful and inspirational. Um, so really want our audience today to leave this event with a similar feeling. So today we're joined by three amazing surgeons, Miss Stella Vig, Miss Nina Mystery and Miss Vasha Kur. And we'll be having a conversation split into the following themes in the context of surgery. So we'll be talking about success and personal achievements, ethnicity and gender diversity, parenthood and work-life balance and overall advice. So throughout our discussion, if you think of a question that you would like us to ask um, our panelists, um, feel free to write them in the chat function below. Um, and this can only be seen by us and we'll try to incorporate them into the discussion. So I'll hand over to Sarika, who will be starting off the panel discussion, but I hope you all really enjoy this event um, and make sure to fill out the feedback form at the end and we'll be choosing a winner, whoever fills out the form to receive a free suturing pad. So yeah, over to you, Sarika. Okay, great. Thank you, Sonam. I'll change it back to um, a spotlight view so we can see our panelists. Um, so to start off, can I just ask um, all our panelists to introduce yourselves Tell us um, which specialty you're doing and your stage of training, as well as any information you'd like to share with us and why you chose to pursue a career in surgery. Okay, shall I start? <laughs> uh, my name is Vasha. I am currently in SDH in January. I have, um, I've, I've been a trainee now for, I guess, 15 years, something like that. And I, I graduated in 05 or 06 and um, graduated from Edinburgh, uh, moved on to, uh, I, I knew I was going to do surgery virtually from third year. So I had aligned my medical school training and my initial um, foundation years training towards surgery. And then I got a run through post in surgery. I've taken a few career breaks throughout to have uh, my two children and I took maternity leave four times and I did a PhD and a year out to do a DASI fellowship. And now I'm at, coming up towards hopefully getting a consultant job within the next year or so, ideally. Um, so that's where I am. Why I did surgery. I think it felt very natural to me. Very early in medical school, I saw that was something that I gravitated towards. Uh, I like working with my hands. I like the decision-making process that was involved in surgery. Um, I like anatomy and it just seemed to make sense. So for me, it was something that I, it was very natural. I'm, I'm not sure maybe I considered enough of the other opportunities around me, but it's something that I, I'm, I've been quite happy and content that I chose and I feel it chose me as much as I chose it. So that's where I am. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, Miss Fig, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, 
There's always the pause, so I'll try and get the mute to work. Um, so I'm Stella Vig. I'm a, a consultant vascular and general surgeon based down at Croydon, uh, which is um, out of London. Um, I, um, I've got lots of other roles. So I'm a Royal College of Surgeons Council member um, and a training programme director. Um, and in the organisation I work for, I'm also one of the clinical directors uh, and I'm heavily involved in the COVID conversation at the moment. So it's interesting hearing what you said, Vasha. So I, I echo everything you said. So it just seemed to fit. Um, it meant I could do something practical. I, I, if anyone says this at this meeting, I will kill you. I know you're recording it, but I can't stand long medical ward rounds. Um, nothing fills me with more dread. Um, and managing um, medical patients where you tweak a potassium and you have to do it over 10 days or a blood pressure just doesn't cut it. I love the fact that you can do something um, to uh, an adult and see a result really, really quickly. Pediatric surgery is a completely different kettle of fish. It scares the pants off me still because kids get sick really, really quickly and then actually rebound really quickly. But the bit in the middle, and I think it's when you become a mum, it makes it even more personal. Uh, and I find paediatric surgery really hard. Um, but it's interesting. So you start off wanting to do surgery, but um, as time goes on, what you find is you still do surgery and you still love it. But actually you find that the other things that make you who you are tend to start to shine through and, and are things that you start to do. So um, at the minute, I feel like I wear lots and lots of hats, but I enjoy wearing all of them. So I'm going to hand over to Nina. Great. Thank you, Ms. Vig. Uh, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel today. Um, I'm really excited to be here and um, really pleased that you asked me. So I'm Nina. Um, I'm currently just finishing off my fellowship in complex middle ear and endoscopic ear surgery in Gloucester. I am already appointed as a consultant in Worcester, which I'm due to start later on this year. Um, I graduated from Leeds Medical School around the same time that Vasha did, so it's been a long time in training for me too, so I graduated 2005. Um, I then got a run-through training post in ENT back in the West Midlands, which is where I'm from and is home for me, so um, I've been sort of around this area ever since. Um, I uh, also have taken time out to have a family and have also done some research. So I have, I've got an MD. I did that down at, at the Ear Institute in, uh, in London uh, at, the, at UCL. And then, um, like Miss Vig, I think actually in more recently in the latter part of my training, I've started to to get some more interest in in other parts of, you know, aside from surgery, um, other bits other bits of medicine and surgery that I'm interested in. So teaching and training, um, I, I actually am the digital educational lead for SFO, which I don't know whether you guys know is the student and foundation doctors in otolaryngology, which is part of ENT UK. Um, I'm also one of the UCL WINS um, sort of surgical mentors um, and recently I've become the consultant representative for the Women in ENT which is um, a national organisation to represent women in ENT and um, you know just to sort of inspire and encourage the next sort of generation of, of ENT um, surgeons. Um, reasons why I decided to do surgery. I think I would again echo what Vasha and Miss Vig have said already. Um, it started early on for me as well when I was a medical student. I've actually been very lucky to have some very um, inspiring mentors along the way and they really um, have taken me under their wing and really encouraged me and um, show me that you know surgery is an amazing specialty to get into um, and again I like using my hands I'm a very practical person I don't like medical ward rounds like Miss Vig uh, they don't suit me it's too long you know I'm a little bit impatient like that I also like the instant results that you get from from doing surgery and the fact that you can really make people um, better uh, quite quickly often uh, just by you know doing procedures on them so um, these are just some of the reasons that I decided to do surgery um, so yeah that's that's me thank you for those great introductions and really great to hear Nina that you're part of the UCL wins mentorship scheme um, so next question, uh, what does it take to succeed in surgery? And this is for all our panelists. Hmm. That's a very broad question. Um, I think um, obviously the first thing that most people are gonna say is that the skills, so you do need the skills, but the skills are the same as learning anything else. So 
learning to cycle or learning to do ballroom dancing. It's the same thing. There are a couple of things, maybe that's a bit more specific to surgical skills, like having um, manual dexterity or a good hand-eye coordination, um, visual spatial skills. But a lot of it is very practice oriented. If, if you, you, you can learn it, it's very learnable. Some of the other skills I think um, are equally as important, if not more so. Um, I think if I were to answer the question, what, what are the ingredients to be a good uh, surgeon? I'll say all of these in equal proportion will definitely involve like having some bravery. You have to have some bravery. You need to face the fear. You need to be able to make decisions quite quickly. Um, being quite, being honest with yourself, being honest with um, the work that you do, understanding your limits and what, what you can and can't do, I think is very important. Um, and having not only the knowledge, but also having common sense. I think common sense is very important when you ma manage patients and understanding, having empathy for how patients might be in that situation. So being very patient focused um, is also very important in being a good surgeon, I think. Um, and finally, I'd say stamina. I'm probably missing out a few others, but stamina is very important. It's, it's a very long race from, as I, both Nina and I have told you from in our experience, for the last 15 years, and I'm still a trainee. My husband and I were in university together. Uh, he's been a consultant now for eight years, <laughs> and I'm still a trainee. So you gotta have you gotta have that patience with yourself. Be kind to yourself. Um, yeah, probably those are the things I can think of off, off the cuff. The main things. Nina, do you want to go next? No mistake, that's fine. You can go ahead. Or do you want? Do you, but, I mean, I, I so it's just uh, further on from what Vasha has said. Um, I think you know having excellent communication skills. Um, you know, not only with patients but with colleagues as well is is I think really important. I think having a sort of team working mentality is important. I think that's essential to to be a successful surgeon because you not only work with other surgeons but you work with other allied health professionals, um, especially in ENT. You know, we work with a lot of other people that um, are very important. So for me, audiologists and um, physiotherapists for balance and things like that. So you, you do need to, to work really as a team because you can't necessarily solve the patient's problems on your own as much as you'd like to. Actually, it takes a team approach um, sometimes. I think to, a lot of people talk about um, sort of resilience and, 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 and things like that. It, it kind of is what Vasha said about stamina. I think you do need some form of endurance because it, it is a long haul. There's no doubt about it. I think, you know, the, the training is long. And if you do additional things um, like research and things along the way, then it, it does take, you know, longer. And you'll see other colleagues that have done other specialties, perhaps finishing and, and uh, being in their senior positions for a lot longer than you have. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, th those are the, the, the sort of main things. I think there's no doubt as well that I think you do need to work hard. Um, but, you know, you guys are all medical students and, you know, you've got to where you've got to already through hard work. So I don't think that that's um, a concern for, for, for any of you. I think, you know, hard work is, is just what it is. You know, you just need to put in the effort and, and the results will come. So that, that, that's, that's the other thing that I would say. And I think one of one of the fundamental things is that you've got to want to do it. And, and although, you know, everyone will be tired of me saying this, but although we're in a women in surgery event, everything we say also applies to everyone else. This, you know, this is about people in surgery. And, and that's always the bottom line for me. Uh, we're talking as women in surgery because we've got lived experiences that are helpful to share with you. Um, but I think remember that our lived experiences are going to be very different to what you are going to experience. So uh, I was laughing earlier before you all came on the call. Um, so I qualified in 1991, so I'm really old. Um, and I was just saying, you know, when I qualified, um, MRI scanner wasn't a conversation. Um, when people had myocardial infarcts, you know, as a medical house officer, my job was to do three serial ECGs on three different days with serial troponins. Um, you know, life has changed so much. Google wasn't an entity. Um, the internet wasn't a conversation. Um, you know, so much has changed in my lifetime and I've still got a way to go. By the time you are surgeons and you are all future surgeons and by the time you actually become trainee surgeons and carry on, 
life is going to be very, very different for you. But one ingredient is vital, and that's that you want to do surgery. If you want to do surgery, it doesn't matter how tired or long or when the stamina is beginning to uh, loosen or, uh, Nina, as you say, the resilience, you just feel that you're not high on resilience that day. If you want to be a surgeon, you'll still get out of bed and go to work. And when you're in work, you'll enjoy it. Yes. All right. So the, the bottom line is, if you are on this call and actually thinking, do you know, I want to be a surgeon, that I think is one of the most critical ingredients of what you, what you, what you want to do going forward. And if you want to be a surgeon, you have to say it and you'll suddenly find the support network, which I also think is really important around you. Now you don't have to, I've got two boys um, and mine are now 24 on the 20th um, and 22. So I'm way down the other side. I know Vasha, they've got really big, really quickly. I know. Way <laughs> down. I remember they were at George's sort of on my coattails. Um, so, you know, life goes really, really quickly, but the support mechanism around you, and I say, you know, just because you're a woman doesn't mean that you're going to have children. You may not wish to have children. You may not wish to be married. Uh, there are all sorts of permutations of what relationships are now and, and what life means to people. But the support network around you with friends and colleagues is actually quite vital to keep you going. Surgery is a, a really lonely world if you're on your own. So I think for me, wanting to do it and, and building up that support network around you is vital to succeed. Yeah, I have to agree. I think it's not just being committed to the specialty, it's also being able to balance it with the rest of your life. You have to, if you don't, you will stop enjoying it. If you stop enjoying it, that's, game over you won't get anymore you everything else will fall off to keep all to keep all your balls in you know in the air you need to make sure that you enjoy it and that's i think that's probably the key thing if you don't enjoy it it's probably not for you and it's it, there's so many parts of surgery though so don't think that if you don't enjoy a particular specialty that you're in during medical school that that's not for you because there's so many you might get exposed to general surgery and you might end up doing ent or orthopedics or something there's so many different parts of surgery so if you don't like one, try something else. Surgery is actually this surgery for me, it's this, this probably the, the only type of medicine I wanted to practice. It's either surgery or I wouldn't be a doctor. Um, and I, I think I knew that when I had to go to MTAS, I had I had to decide. And I I it was very clear to me one way or the other. Thank you so much. They were really inspiring answers from all of you. Um, well, one of our next questions is, what would you say has been your biggest achievement during your surgical career so far? Oh, well, <laughs> one of mine has just walked in. Hello. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Okay. See you later. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. So these are perhaps my two great achievements in the last few years. And they've are... grown up as well. My no. God. Look at them. <laughs> okay. Oh. What are their names? Okay, thanks. Bye, Mom. You going for a walk? Okay. No, we're not going to carry on tidying up our okay. rooms. Okay. Fine. No, we are going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you for the visit. Sorry about that. Um, maybe someone else wants to answer first. <laughs> I think in terms of the, my biggest achievement, uh, I think it's ongoing. The fact that I've still continued to train and practice. There's been a few challenges along the way. Um, and despite everything, I think the fact that I've continued to keep to the tasks that I want to do, I think I probably my, my biggest achievement for me personally would be the fact that I'm still on this journey. And I think for me, they, they fall into three categories, I suppose. I think there's the professional bit. So, you know, there is something, you, you know, you get into med school and you think, God, I've got into med school, it's done. And then you realise you've got to apply for foundation and then as an SHO and then a registrar. Nina's just got a, a consultant post and Bash is going to get a consultant post quite soon. So, you know, all the things that go. And then you get to a consultant post and think, gosh, I've done it. That's the pinnacle of my career. And then you realise, oh, my God, there's a whole lifetime to go. Um, and I suppose for me, on a professional side, getting in as council member to the Royal College of Surgeons of England was a big thing. 
there haven't been many females, there haven't been many Asians. Um, and right now the pale male and very stale top ranks that we've got as vice president and three VPs, all of whom are um, white men, is an interesting reflection of our leadership. Now they're all wonderful. and I, Nobody would ever get me to say anything but that they are wonderful because they really are. Um, and you know, Neil Mortensen, who's the president of our college, actually started out, you know, as his, his father was a vicar. And, you know, he's come from one of the poorest backgrounds you can imagine. And he's been amazing at what he's achieved. And the same with, you know, the two Tims and, and um, uh, Cliff, but they're representative of one part of surgical society um, and surgery now is really diverse. Um, and so that for me now is, that's, you know, been a great, um, step in but actually there's a way to go there as well so we, we think about what we've achieved but there's always the next step and I think that's the nice thing about surgery there's always the next step like Vasha um, I'm the same I've got two kids and uh, I've now been married to my husband for 27 years which I think is a is a real coup in surgery because it's not common uh, and um, I'm hoping that we see more and more of very healthy, long-lasting relationships. And I think, Vasha, that speaks back to the conversation you were having, which is um, it's important to have balance in your life. Uh, the old-fashioned way of thinking was you went into surgery and you were a slave and you were wedded to surgery. And that's all you did. That's not how your surgical careers are going to work. You're going to be stepping in, stepping out, doing, you know, entrepreneurships and running businesses and doing a bit of research and going off and doing charity and Climbing Mount Everest, if you haven't done it already, you know, there's so much that you will be doing um, that your personal achievements will be um, very, very different to ours because you will achieve so much more because the platforms that we have achieved. So, Vash, I'm going to talk about you personally for a minute and I hope you don't mind. But um, when I had my two children, I took 12 weeks off both times because I was the first female uh, trainee registrar appointed in Wales because I'm from North Wales I was born in in Bangor um, and you know woe betide a female registrar got pregnant I mean that just wasn't done and of course I got pregnant um, so I took 12 weeks off first time and 12 weeks off second time for both my children um, and I can remember Vasha coming to me and telling me she was pregnant quite a long time ago now so it's lovely to see how big the kids are and um, the conversation you know she said I'm going to come back in 12 weeks and I went, no, you're not. Uh, you know, you guys are going to enjoy having babies. You're going to enjoy being mothers because actually life is long and your careers are long. Um, and for all of you who are on the call who are around 24, 25, um, you've got a 60% chance of living to 100. You've got, a, I think it's about 40% to living to 110. Okay, so you've got huge careers to go. So balance your lives and, and just make it count, guys. And again, Nina, I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you, Ms. Vig. Um, I think, you know, again, I'm, I, I would say similar to what already um, Vasha and Ms. Vig have already said. I think in terms of professional achievements, um, you know, there've been many throughout my career. Um, I think actually to name a couple, so um, actually doing my research, um, I'm sure Vasha and Ms. Vig know that we, we all talk about research in, in surgery and, you know, it's such a, a essential component because, you know, we need to manage in an evidence base. We need to work in an evidence based manner. Um, actually getting down to the nitty gritty of research, though, um, for those of for those who do it, um, it's not always just, you know, an easy thing to do. So actually, I found it quite challenging when I did when I did mine. Uh, it was lab based, you know, things didn't work. Uh, it was massively frustrating at some points. Um, but having said that, actually, I got through it and, you know, managed to get an MD out of it and also uh, publish some papers, which is, you know, what what actually I'm very proud of. Um, and um, I think it's taught me to be a better surgeon as well, um, because there's a lot of transferable skills that you get from doing research. Um, so I'd say that that's one of the one of the achievements that I can name. Um, the the other thing is, um, is is the is you know the non-professional um, aspect of of my work of 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 my life, which is my family. So again, I've got two children, um, and I would say that they're my biggest achievements uh, to date. 
um, outside of my work. Um, and I would, you know, I think, again, as the others have said, you know, it's really, really important to have that balance and, and that um, support network outside of work, um, because without it, actually, I don't think I'd be able to do the job that I do and or be as good at it, actually. So I, I value them very much. So, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of questions from the rest of the audience as well. Uh, so going back to number two, which was what does it take to succeed in surgery? Someone was asking, um, how have you dealt with insecurities about your skills and knowledge? So when I first came back from research, I took two and a half years um, and I finished my PhD last March. And when I first came back from research, I hadn't operated for, for a long time because I did pure research. I didn't do um, any uh, operating in that time or very sporadic operating in that time. So when I first came back, obviously there was lo a lockdown and there was no operating. So that made it even worse. It's very difficult for me to go back to the level of skill that I felt I should be able to attain at that time. And I had a huge amount of imposter syndrome and I thought I wasn't... Um, managing at the level that I should have been managing. And I found that very, very difficult. As someone, as, as probably many of you are, you've attained a, a certain level and you expect a certain level of yourself and you beat yourself up about it. And you think this is not good enough and I should be a lot better. Uh, and I must say, I found those couple of months, March to June last year, incredibly difficult from a, from a personal point of view. I didn't, um, I didn't feel brave enough to talk about it. I was, I very much internalized and I kept it to myself and I, I could feel myself going into the, the world and I, so then I just shook myself and I said, you've got to get a grip. And I began to talk about it. Talked about it to my husband, talked about it to a few of my friends, non-surgical friends. Um, and I found that helped. And then I began to make a structured plan because I'm that the type of person I am. So I made, I made a plan, like a tick box and I, started doing things about it to make sure that I've made myself better than I was. And the more confidence I gained doing the things I was supposed to be doing, the, the better I felt about things. And, and then you find that the imposter syndrome thing gets better and you feel more confident. So I think it's a lot of it is knowing how to manage your fears, knowing and owning your fears. If you understand it and you take ownership of it, you'll feel a lot better. And I think that's probably the way I managed it. And I found that very helpful. Um, very, very recently, I found a colleague of mine telling me that she's going through a very similar thing. So I gave her, I took a picture of the thing that I'd made, my little handwritten thing, and I gave it to her. And she sent me a message last night saying that she's using a similar step to get through her things. I think it's very transferable. And people, if you understand what you need to do, you can actually pay it forward and help other people to, who are going through the same journey. Um, but I'm di digressing a bit. So I, th I think yeah, it's very much own, own the fear, make a plan and go through it. Be focused and you'll get through it. Um, I, I was just going to say, uh, seconding what Vasha said, I think it is hard, you know, when you take time out either through research or even after maternity leave, I think I felt quite uneasy coming back because I hadn't, I actually took about 11 months um, and 10 months with uh, both my children and um, it was quite a while to be out, completely out of, 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 you know training and not operating at all um and so i did feel like that and i think um you know just actually um speaking to speaking to colleagues and other people that have perhaps been through the similar situations really makes a difference because i think you know you're not alone there are other people without a doubt that will have been through the exact same thing that you have and the thing is until you start to talk about it you don't realize that there are other people out there you know if you keep things to yourself um it can make things pretty hard and you know you um, it, it doesn't need to be like that and I think the other thing about imposter syndrome is that there's a lot of literature out there now especially in relation to surgery um, in fact and I don't think it was that you know it wasn't talked about previously I think it's only really been in the last sort of couple of years that I've noticed that there are articles about it and people are, are talking about it and and the fact that it exists and and not only for for women I think you know there's an, an element of it existing for men as well but you know it hasn't previously been discussed so um, you know there is a lot of a lot of literature out there, a lot of help out there, and it's just about speaking up and, and getting those resources and speaking to people that can help. So that's, that's the other thing that I wanted to say. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that information with us. It was really, really helpful and really insightful. 
Um, I think we'll move on to our second section of the discussion, which is about ethnicity. Um, so, Ms. Big, you mentioned that you're currently a member of the Council for the Royal College of Surgeons, which is amazing. As you said, it's one of your biggest achievements. So following on from that, a question we have for all our panelists is, do you think that gender and ethnicity has an impact on attaining opportunities such as this or opportunities within surgery in general? Um, yeah, I'm open to all our panelists. Oh, Sid, I think you might have muted the panel. It's all right. Yeah, I think you have to unmute us as we go along there. Uh, that's not an issue. Um, so it's interesting when I, so I was born and brought up in, so I'm, I'm Punjabi from background. Mum and dad came over in the 1960s. Um, and, you know, I was brought up where people spoke Welsh. And if you weren't English, you were absolutely fine because uh, um, the Welsh hate the English. Um, so diversity and conversations were really strange when I went to university because it hadn't occurred to me at any point in time that I was going to have a hard time going through um, getting into surgery. Now, um, differential attainment once you're in is interesting because because we're surgeons, because we want to succeed, you know it's going to be difficult. So you make yourself 110, 120% ready. So you get through and you just get on with it and you get the next job and whatever and it's and it works. And it's only when you start looking back, you realize that, that the networks that occur that you're not involved in make a difference. So the offers for papers or your name added to someone's paper or um, you know, going out on a, a research trip or, or an evening meal where things are discussed and then opportunities arise the next day or the tap on your shoulder that allows you to get the job and know in advance. Um, at consultant interviews, and I, I, you know, I went to four in the end, where jobs were predetermined and if I'm really honest, they were jobs for the boys. That all exists. My remit and the remit of uh, societies like Visa, the remit of BAPIO, the conversation which is the diversity review at the college, needs to be actually a recognition that it exists, because it does, um, and recognition that we need to ensure this equity. Now, it's not equality. It's not about opening doors to everyone and saying, come in. It's about equity, giving you the tools that you need to actually do the job well and properly. And that's why I'm here, giving up my Saturday talking to you guys. I know Nina and Vash, I'd love to hear your thoughts, but um, it exists, it will change as time goes on. But we have to remember that this country has gone from an era where Sir Lancelot Spratt, who you know, was a, a film character, was the norm, that people really existed who you know, had huge houses and, and everything else in the world and came from you know, land endowed, uh, families that came through all of that existed that will always exist because that's the world but the conversation is how do we ensure that people who want to do what we are doing are enabled to do it and enabled to do it well um, and there are enough of us around now to give everybody that helping hand I think it's true that in most jobs, you may feel that there are different degrees of undertones of perhaps, I guess, if you want to give it a name, sexism or racism or something, that there are degrees of it that will, that will be around no matter where, where you are. Um, and you have to develop almost a sort of thick skinness to it and just get yourself in there. You have to make yourself be as visible as everyone else while still being authentic and being yourself but you still have to make sure you're in there with the boys, with everyone else and standing shoulder to shoulder, not making it seem like just because you come from a different, I, I moved to the UK from Malaysia. I grew up in Malaysia. I moved here on my own, no, no other friends, just on my own without any family in the UK. I moved here and I went to university in Edinburgh in from a very warm country to a very cold, the, the coldest part you can find moving to Aberdeen. But it, and, 
I found from the very start that if I got myself involved in the right groups, I, I found myself, I was, um, I was sent to present a carothoracic paper in fourth year, um, which I think was, I was probably the only medical student sent. And I, it, it, although I was female and I was British, I, I wasn't British and I was um, of Indian origin, I, I had these opportunities. I gave myself the opportunity. You have to work a lot more. Sometimes you do feel like you're doing a lot more to make yourself present and visible. But these are things that you have to do. And I think I'm doing it less because people like Ms. Vig has done it more for me. And I'm hoping that you guys, when you guys get to that point, you are doing it less than we are now. Um, as, as more of us get into those positions and are like in Nina's case, you're holding all these different responsibilities and you're in positions of power, as more of us do that, it, the easier it becomes for everyone. And the bold we become and the more vocal we become, the better it is. So having a voice and using it is so, so important in these situations. But yeah, and also having a bit of thick, thick skinness is quite important. Yeah, I mean, I would second what um, Vash has just said. I think people, you know, like Miss Vig, uh, have, you know, are, are making already making steps towards changing things, and we would hope to follow in those footsteps. And we'd hope that you guys would then follow in those footsteps to that just try and change things. I think the real, I think that there is there's a lot of unconscious bias. I think that that, that exists. I know this term is banded around quite a lot, but there is still that that. Um, I wouldn't say that the the old boys club is you know is you know um, alive and kicking everywhere in all the specialties, but there is still undertones of it in some areas. I think, and I think just as Vasha said, I think you don't be put off by that. I think you've just got to put yourself in a position where you're you know able to perhaps make the most of any opportunities that arise. And like Vasha said, stand shoulder to shoulder with these people and just make yourself available, you know, be enthusiastic, want to get involved. And then things should hopefully come your way and, you know, you can get involved in things and make, make the changes that you need to make. Um, I really think that um, going back to gender for, for women, I think there are, are still quite a lot of obstacles when it comes to taking up positions of leadership and management, whether that's either locally, regionally or nationally, as Miss Figgers has, you know, has done. And she said that it's one of her biggest achievements. And, you know, that really is because I, I hear from colleagues um, that it, they still have a lot of difficulty um, getting into these positions. Often they're not told about them. Often they already have somebody else in mind. Um, you know, these kinds of things still exist. And I think the way that we need to sort of work to change things is to is is in these areas really, you know, starting at a local level and then moving on to sort of doing changing things nationally. And I think perhaps apart from the gender bias, maybe there's even more disparity for perhaps uh, based on ethnicity. I mean, I, I'm not sure about that. I haven't yet experience that myself but I know that others perhaps have so I think that these are all things that we need to recognize but you know don't be worried about them you put yourselves out there and and um, and be in the position where you can take on these roles because if you don't try and if we don't keep trying then things aren't going to change thank you so much so we've just touched upon things looking like the old boys club, which I think Nina, you mentioned. Um, I feel for me, Sarah and Sonam anyway, we've all, we've, all three of us have discussed this and we do think, especially in med school now, we kind of feel the same that things already start to feel like the old boys club. Um, in your opinions, do you think that surgical culture is inclusive of all ethnicities and kind of genders? Or how do you think we can overcome that feeling of the old, old boys club in during whilst we're surgical trainees? From a personal point of view, I think um, I've found most places I've worked in quite, quite welcoming. I've not had um, much trouble where I felt that I was being excluded um, in any of any of the jobs since I was an, a, a foundation trainee. But I, I have had, I'll tell you a two personal like a, a, a anecdotes that might Give you some flavor as to how these things happen. When I was pregnant uh, with my first with my first child, I moved from Croydon to another hospital, and I was supposed to do a particular specialty. But the surgeon there took me aside and said, "Don't take this personally. It's not about you. 
is pregnant and I don't work with pregnant women. Um, and he, I got moved to another specialty, which is not what I wanted to do with a surgeon who was about to retire and I didn't get to do very much. And I was told that I should be grateful because I was pregnant so that I wouldn't have to do very much. And it was very frustrating because I wanted to do a and it was very difficult. And I found that something I, I didn't know how to manage. I, I didn't know that I could stand up to that. I didn't realize that I maybe could have questioned that decision. I just took it. I just took it and I stuck with it for a few months and I was, I didn't enjoy that period of time. Um, and then I left and had my baby. Um, but looking back, I think I should have maybe queried it and maybe asked some questions to make sure that I got the opportunities that I had gone there to have. Um, and I think that is something that, uh, more, so that's the first anecdote. And my second anecdote was um, also a, another surgeon who, um, explained to me that he felt that women um, women who are more boyish make better surgeons. Uh, and this is more recently in this in the last few years. And he was saying this as if he was giving me advice, like you know, if you the more the more manly you are, the better you are at surgery. It was a very odd conversation. And both these conversations made me realize that there is a difference in how people perceive. Um, how people perceive me and how I perceive myself. And I think then trying to ensure that the person I'm speaking to, which I didn't do the first time, but the more recent time, I made sure that they understood that um, there was, it wasn't that there was no difference between men and women. And I had this, I was dogged about it. And I went back to talk to him about it and showed him evidence about skill sets and things like that. I'm not sure if I changed his mind, but I didn't let it go. I didn't want someone else to come by five years later and have this man say the same thing to them. And so I made, I made it a very personal thing to go and to him over and over again. Um, I'm not sure whether some of you may have seen, but I think in JAMA at the end of the year, maybe um, like September last year, there was an article that said that women in surgery around the world hold fewer positions of power. So certainly Miss Vig has certainly broken some of those barriers, but it's certainly true. So if you get an opportunity to hold a position of power, take it. If you get a position, an opportunity to be in ASGBI or any one of these positions, take it. Um, and if you, your question was, how do we break the all boys club and kind of make sure you stand shoulder to shoulder with them? I know it's easy to say, not always easy to do. Um, and when someone's talking about rugby, something which I have no interest or um, any, knowledge of, I find it difficult to break into the conversation. If they're having a game on Saturday, but you know, they're having a rugby game on Saturday, and that's where a lot of, it's a lot, a lot of the networking happens outside of theatres. It happens in social circumstances and who you know and um, who, who you have similar viewpoints with. So then you have to find another area where you share a, a commonality with them or values with them, something else, um, food or something. And I find that often breaks ice. I mean, it breaks ice. And when people find that you are very similar, um, it helps. I think that certainly is one way of making sure that you can break into the uh, all boys club. Thank you. Sorry, Sorry, I was going to say, Anisha, I think the are you going to be able to get rid of the old boys club completely? The answer is you're never going to be able to do that. Um, would people say that we're setting up a new uh, Indian Medical Association club? Yeah, we would be accused of that. Is women in surgery a club? The answer is yes, it is. So there will always be social networks. You cannot possibly be part of all social networks. But I think what is... Uh, important, two things are important. One is that um, it's no longer acceptable for the behaviours that Vasha describes to be uh, part of the world we live in, part of medicine, and then part of surgical training. Right? They're, they're just not acceptable. It's slightly easier for me to take people on. It's, you know, a little bit less easy, but still relatively easy for Vasha and Nina to take things on. As medical students in theatres, in medical students in clinics, it's even harder for you to call it out. But there are always people around you who can do that for you. So if people are making inappropriate comments, um, you do need to call it out. And if you can't do it personally because you're worried about doing it, go and find an advocate that will do it on your behalf. But if you see someone else going through that, again, 
it is your role and responsibility to either find an advocate or call it out. So I think the transparency conversation is becoming more and more. My husband always tells me um, he can't say many things in front of me because he's not politically correct anymore. And Vasha knows my husband really well and Nupi's definitely not politically correct. Um, so, and I have to keep telling him off. So there is something about, you know, I, I don't know whether you guys have watched the um, TV uh, bits where they go back to um, uh, television in, in the early nineties and eighties. Um, uh, and you look at it and think, oh, my God, was that really what was being said? That's what's happening, but actually in the medical world right now. And as time goes on and some of the old surgeons disappear, you'll find the environment that you work in will change. The second thing, just going back to Nina's point um, about leadership, Vasha, you made it as well. Um, the leadership means that when you see opportunities, so it's fantastic Beam has been set up. Fantastic Beast has been set up. You guys have given yourselves... Um, presidencies and vice presidents of the society you're now running you need to hand on that baton and say to people this is an opportunity would you like to take it so you create opportunities you you make sure the opportunities are there the american women in surgery did a, a fantastic piece they made sure that every single position of authority that went through they found them they tapped people on the shoulder not just women but advocates of women and said, it would be really good if you went for this position. And they say the most commonest answer that came back was, I can't, I'm not ready. And what they did was mentored and supported to make sure. So uh, Sonam, you, you, uh, Nina, you talk about the UCL uh, mentor. I've got two mentees. I've, I've not actually met them because I've been too busy, but I will get around to it. But um, you know, the mentorship programs that are running are incredible. And you guys as medical students, you don't need us to mentor, you guys as medical students can mentor. So we've got a couple of people who are first years on the call. Um, you guys are the role models that will mentor going forward and you guys are the ones that will change things. So don't worry about the old boys club. We can sort that out, but let's not invent new clubs and let's make sure we've got a network of people who want to work together. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question is, did you or do you face any pressures as an Indian woman pursuing surgery from your family or from the Indian community? Uh, shall I go? Shall I go first? Or Vashi, were you going to go? No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I think for this, my answer is going to be quite short because I, I um, uh, so I, my background is I'm Gujarati. Um, Mum and dad uh, were both born in Kenya and they came over here um, like in the 70s. Um, I'm from a non-medical family. Um, so, you know, my parents are not medics um, and I have a, my brother's a, a doctor, he's a surgeon, um, but it's just the two of us um, and everybody else, you know, they're, they're in non-medical professions. Um, I, I, you know, when I decided that I wanted to do medicine, my mum and dad actually were very, very supportive. They've they've not tried to coerce me. They've not been the kind of parents that have, you know, either pushed me one way or another. And I feel like I've been very, very lucky in that. And then, you know, the decision to do surgery, they've been they've been fully supportive and they've they've always been there um, throughout. So, you know, I think that actually, you know, no, I haven't felt that there's been any barriers or any judgment from any part of my family or, you know, the wider community as it were um everybody seems to you know be happy and um and be supportive so so that that, that was that's what i wanted to say about that i'm sure you guys have maybe vasha and miss vick have got different um opinions on things perhaps but yeah should i go next miss vick um i come from a family with so I have a twin brother and my parents are amazing. Like if I said I was going to be prime minister, they would be like, yep, yep, she's going to be prime minister. Like they were just amazing. Um, and Miss Vick has met my mum. She's just a, a wonderful, wonderful mum. And my dad too. Um, but I come from Malaysia and Malaysia is a very multi multicultural society. And I must say in terms of men and women equality, there's, it's, I think, perhaps more equal than a lot of other countries. Women achieve prison to power far more readily. There's a lot of matriarchal society in Malaysia. So women often are quite strong and you, you see lots of strong women in Malaysia quite easily. Uh, but I, mo I moved here and I got married to a, a man who's also of Indian origin. And I remember quite early in my marriage, my in-laws trying to talk me into becoming a GP. At this point, I just passed the MRCS exam. I'd just written a surgical textbook. And my father was, my, my 
father knows very proud of the fact that I've written this book was in the same breath as trying to talk me into becoming an EP so it was more family friendly um, and even two years ago I had a similar conversation with my in-law so you, you will find people who won't think surgery is very um, family friend friendly perhaps and may think maybe it doesn't suit being an Indian woman uh, uh, as an Indian now, with two kids who I'm immensely proud of, I feel like it's definitely achievable. Um, so if you are looking at the, and if you are thinking, oh, will I compromise on having a family? If the things that you're hearing are things like this, don't, don't you won't compromise on having a family. I have, um, you can certainly contact me personally. I'll tell you the kind of things that can help, but it's very, very achievable. So, so it's interesting, isn't it? So we talk about um, the British uh, uh, Indian Surgical Association, but just go back and think about India. Okay, so India is vast. Um, I can't remember the numbers. I think you can put 15 Great Britons or 30 Great Britons into India. It's a huge, it's a huge continent. Um, and we go from, you know, the number of the diversity in India with the languages spoken and the religions that are the beliefs that are held um, and from the uh, acceptance in Mumbai of wearing anything you want and being more fashion conscious than, than London uh, to, you know, some of the really reserved areas in India that we've all come from and our parents have come from and of course depending on the age of your parents so um i remember when my brother was getting married we went back to india to go and you know obviously going back to jewelry and everything else and um they all thought my brother was really cute because um he upheld the values of 1960s india where of course india had moved on um so the backgrounds that you come from uh, as far as i know my generation if you were Indian, you were going to become a surgeon, you were going to become a doctor or an engineer. That was the bottom line, really. You didn't have any other um, conversations about any other jobs. And if you didn't do those, then actually your parents couldn't sit there proud and explain to the rest of the family that's what you were doing. So um, I think the so the support you get from your family is very variable depending on the community that you live in. What is really, really difficult is when you then also add to that diversity of getting married and bringing in the culture that your husband or partner believes in. Um, the, the bottom line to this goes back to what Nina and Basha said at the very, very beginning, which is resilience and stamina and believing in yourself. Okay, you've got to do what's right for you. And this sounds really awful. Your parents are not there for, forever. Your other half is, your children are, and what you've got to do is what's right for you. So if being a surgeon, it makes you happy, then you've got to get on with it. And again, what you've got to do is find like-minded people who can support you through the journeys. You might go through something where someone tells you you can't do something. I can tell you, between the three of us, we've probably heard absolutely anything, anyone wishes to say, we've heard it before. And we can tell you that it's not right or it's there's a way around it or a mitigation or whatever. So I think if people are undermining what you want to do, what you've got to do is, is like Vasha said earlier, is reach out and talk to people and talk to people you trust to help you navigate that, that through. But remember every single individual. So our lived experiences as Indian women are not going to be universal. There are so many, I mean, there are, you know, I've had, so many trainees go through my hands and you know some of the the pressures put on some of the the trainees is absolutely horrendous we've had uh we've had um individuals who was told that she needed to get married because she didn't get married um that uh, the rest of the family would be taken out of university because she was a senior role model and she had to do what was right um I've had a trainee who was sent to uh, Pakistan to get married and, and was told that she had to get married. And again, surgical career was going to be over. There are so many pressures in the background, but the most important thing is to reach out and get help because there is so much support. And you know, I've, I've actually talked to trainees parents. I mean, Vasha, not yours, because your mum's just gorgeous and for, met her for a different reason, but I've actually met trainees parents to have conversations with them because they've just said, Miss Vig, I don't know what to do. So guys, there are pressures behind, but there's also a lot of support behind you as well. Thank you for that advice. Um, 
so I think moving on to parenthood and family life um they say there's no good time to have children but if you had to pick or advice like when would be the best time in surgical training to do so there's no good time to have children <laughs> I think I, it's going to be very personal um I think until I found out I was pregnant I didn't even think I was female like I don't think I didn't think anyone knew I was female I don't know if that makes sense but I was just like the voice I was there at work all the time I didn't um I didn't feel any different from any of the boy surgeons and suddenly I was pregnant and I thought oh my goodness now everyone is going to know I'm a girl um, <laughs> and um I, that's when I first began to feel um, that it was a different type of um, route that I, I will be taking. And true enough, that that did happen. And I think the 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 way to do the way I have done it and the way it works for me and my children and family is that just like being a surgeon, you, I tend to be a little bit uh, controlling. So I do want to know what's going on with my kids, and I do like to know. Um, with a fair amount of detail. I wouldn't say I'm a tiger mum, but my husband would. So I, I, do have, I do have a good overview of what's happening with them. But to do it well, I've had to delegate. I've had to outsource some of this um, control to other people. So we have a live-in nanny and we've had a live-in nanny for many, many years. Um, so if, in terms of homeschooling in the last few months, we haven't had to send our children into school. We've um, kept them home and if I can still oversee the homework and stuff and, and my, my, my living nanny does help with that. And I feel that certainly helps. So if you outsource well and learn to delegate some things well, it makes your life a lot easier to live and a lot more enjoyable. So the time I have with my, with my children, I, I do make sure that I do all the things I need to do. So I make sure I have a list of things. Sometimes I'm driving home from work, I make a list of things I need to do when I get home and I do them when I get home. Uh, and also having a very, um, having a partner who is able to support you and fit in like a jigsaw. So they, the things that you do, you, you, you do different areas. So all areas get covered or as many areas as possible get covered. Um, my son recently had to sit a fairly big exam and he's seven so it's not like huge but a fairly big exam for a seven-year-old and I had to make sure that I was there to help support him through that so I took a few weeks off work um, and I spoke to my hospital and I said I want to make sure that I still go to some of my operating lists and I, and I, I made it happen so I sat down worked through the timetable myself presented them with this option of how it would work so I could still be there for his 30 days before the exam and so I could support him and still not miss out on my training opportunity. So there are things that you can do to make it work, but it does take a fair amount of planning. Uh, if you want to be a good mum, a good surgeon, a good person, you do need to have a good, um, uh, you, it does take planning and organisation. I think organisational skills are probably key to being a good surgeon and uh, to having a, a good balance for to, a, to how you, you live your family and personal life. Uh, do you want to go next, Miss Vig? No, go on, Nina. Okay, so um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I, I, um, so I've got two children, as I said before, and like Vasha, I think that I would probably say that there's no right or wrong answer in terms of you know the best time to have children. I think it's very, very much an individual decision. Um, so I had both of my children in training, um, and it was before I did the exams. So I think I had them in ST five and ST six. Um, so it meant that I was then revising um, and writing up my MD and revising for the FRCS with with quite young children. But, you know, I know that I'm not alone and actually having spoken to colleagues before me, I know that other people have gone through similar situations and they had got through it. So that, you know, gave me some motivation to think that actually, you know, this is this can happen and that I can manage this. Um, I think that support is really vital so you know support from your partner um support from your family if they're nearby um and also support from other other individuals so um like vasha we also have a nanny she doesn't live in but you know without her we couldn't manage because i'm also um married to an to my husband's a surgeon as well so there's a there's a lot of juggling that goes on in our lives but you know it, it is possible 
So I've had friends uh, that have had children as consultants and um, I don't know whether they've necessarily found it easy because they've not obviously got a comparison, um, you know, they, but, but they seemed, I think the one thing that I spoke to one of my colleagues that she said was that the timetable was very much set. She knew that she wasn't moving hospitals or, you know, potentially having to relocate or, or, or commute further or, you know, things were a little bit more set in stone as a consultant. And I'm, I'm sure Ms. Vig will be able to, to, to talk about this as well. That So, so she felt much more comfortable actually having children um, as a consultant versus being a trainee, because being a trainee, there's, there's a lot more, um, you know moving around potentially moving hospitals commuting potentially you might have to do non-resident on calls um uh, sorry resident on calls uh, and be be in hospital so um you know all those things kind of make a difference and you've got to factor all these things in um but i think definitely having a support network and being organized managing your time all these things make a, a really big difference to to, to balancing everything and you know as you can see from the people that are on this panel it's all possible so don't get disheartened and don't think that you know motherhood can't fit in with surgery it certainly can it's just about um doing what's right for you and 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 um balancing you know everything that that you need to to make it work and and if you think about things biologically you're more fertile below 30 men are fertile all the way through so men can just work out when is the right time for them but for women um you know below 30 you're fertile between 30 and 40 it gets harder and above 40 it's really really tough um and I come from a world where there were lots of women who were waiting to have children until they get to consultant posts and um then really struggling and not having children and actually always regretting that they made that mistake uh, or that decision whether it was a mistake or not um so I think so I I I my original plan was to have two when I um, got a consultant job and then somehow I was pregnant twice and hadn't planned for it. Um, so, but it seemed to work out well. So um, I think my response to you is the other way around. I think you need to do it dependent on who you are and when your biological clock is right, when you want to have children and make the surgical career work around your aspirations of being parents. So do it the other way around. Don't let surgery dictate when you have your children. All right, we'll make it work. Okay, great. Um, you've all mentioned about having a great support network and how that's been an important part of balancing surgery with other commitments, including parenthood. Um, recently, I've actually spoken to a few female surgeons who have mentioned that the less than full-time training program has also been a great help in terms of being able to balance commitments. Um, so following on from this, what other changes, if any, do you hope to see within the healthcare system to account for female surgeons balancing parenthood? Um, I think COVID has taught us that we can actually work from home. We can actually work from home a lot more than we have up, up to this point. I think allowing us to work from home will make things a lot more manageable and flexi working as well. So um, I, I have done a lot more. Uh, I, I'm quite used to working at three o'clock in the morning because I, I find I'm more productive at that time. And I can do a lot of my admin stuff at that time rather than and normal hours. Clearly, my husband's not looking after the kids as I thought he was. Um, but I do find that flexible working and working from home helps a lot. I've done far more clinics using uh, Attend Anywhere, which is a video app for clinics. And I think that's quite helpful as well. So allowing um, those kind of work working conditions certainly help. I have never worked um, less than full time, um, but I, I think even the fact that that is now part of surgical training has certainly been very, very helpful. And like a lot more women has made the career a lot more attainable for a lot more women. Um, and in terms of network, you need to find a network of family or friends that can help you. I have no one local to where I am. So I've had to have nannies and a lot of friends. Um, when I first had my, when I first had my children, uh, when I first had my son, I had my FRCS, it was not very well planned. I had my FRCS exam three months after he was born. Um, that was certainly, I just assumed it was maternity leave and it's holiday, so I should be fine. Well, it wasn't, it's quite a tough time to have an exam, but it, it worked out all right. 
um, but at that time I had my mum come and stay with me. And I think without my mum, that would have been hard. So uh, recognizing that you need people around you is very, very, very important throughout. Um, even now without my nanny, I would find it very hard to work while there's homeschooling. <laughs> my nanny's often at the weekends, can you tell? <laughs> I'm going to put myself on mute and get these guys out of here. <laughs> so, so I think it's, um, uh, we, you know, we talk about the support network for um, when you have children and, and, you know, I've, I've still got no pair. Um, he's, he's my wife, really. She, she gets things, the laundry to the right place and, and post things when I need them and all sorts. So that she's no longer live in um, and she's live out, but I, I still need, support to make my life work um but i think also remember that the support network's not just for when you have children um you know your parents are going to get older you've got families uh and you know lots of things can happen that that mean that support network is important um and it's just a trusted circle of friends and, and we've all got those um but you can you can outsource so much uh, to be able to help and uh, Vasha and Nina, I don't know whether you've got to the point where you feel guilty about some of the things uh, that you've outsourced. Um, and I, I, the only thing I can tell you to, to sort of just calm everything down is um, I wrote an article for the BMJ probably about four years ago now. And one of the questions was, um, what, uh, what do you regret? And, and my answer, which obviously went out in print, was um, uh, I, I regret probably just being a good enough mother, good enough surgeon, um, and probably haven't excelled at either. Anyway, my youngest son immediately picked up the phone to me and said, Mum, you're an idiot. Why did you write that? And the oldest son said, where have you not been? And, and there's a personal guilt you carry, which is not perceived by anyone else. It's your personal guilt. And when I talk to people outside of surgery, it doesn't matter what job you do, there is something about being a mother that means that when you leave your children, you feel guilty. It's just programmed. So you just have to accept it's programmed and accept that you're going to feel guilty and accept it makes no difference at all. The kids grow up despite you. Uh, I mean, that's really reassuring to hear, Miss Vickers. The guilt is definitely something that I suffer with. I mean, uh, you know, I think we all feel it, don't you, when you're late um working you've you know you've the case has run over or for whatever reason you're stuck at work and then I you know there's quite often times when I've not made it back uh, for bedtime the kids are already asleep my children go to sleep quite early they go they're in bed normally by seven half seven so you know I'll miss them and then you do feel bad but actually you know just making the most of whatever time you have together um is really important so I think I really value weekends and um you know any any annual leave that we take we try and always you know spend maximum amount of time with the children and and maximize the the, the time we have with them at those at those moments so I think you know it's just about getting the balance there um going back to the less than full time I again like Vasha I haven't trained less than full time but I have colleagues that have and I think that you know you have to do whatever works for you the other thing that's um, becoming a little bit more um, acceptable is um, shared parental leave. So I think that that's, you know, if if that's an option um, um, as a couple, then, you know, that can work as well. So it doesn't just have to be um, the female uh, that takes the leave. You know, it could be the partner that takes some leave as well. Um, so, you know, I think that's becoming a little bit more acceptable as well now. And it's becoming more recognised. Um, in fact, I had... Um, one colleague who's um, a GP and her husband's actually a neurosurgeon and he decided uh, to take six months out and um, spend that time with with the the, the new baby uh, which I thought was fantastic you know what a role model for you know other trainees and people coming through um, so I think that that's you know a, a really good thing the other piece of advice like Miss Vig and, and, and Vasha have already said is that is about a delegating and outsourcing responsibility um, quite a senior um, female surgeon told me that you should spend as much money on childcare that you can afford, uh, afford to. So, you know, whatever you can afford, uh, spend that money on childcare because it really does make, make your life easier. You know, it means you don't worry necessarily about being late home or not making the nursery pick up or the school pick up or, you know, it just takes that added pressure off you and, and means that you can just, you can do your job, but then, you know, once you get home, you can, you can be mum as well. And, you know, um, I think it just, it just makes things easier. So uh, that, that's another piece of advice, I think good advice that I was given quite early on. Um, uh, and it's definitely made a difference for me.
Um, Basha, you said that you mentioned your husband became a consultant eight years ago. Um, obviously, that's how do you how did you find that experience for you? Kind of the different. Um, I have a fantastic husband, I must say. He's, he's not within hearing distance, so it's fine for me to say that. He's we've been together since university. I, it was it was a bit. It was actually great. I think I, I found myself just celebrating the fact that he became a consultant. Um, and I, I don't think it was something, I, I don't think it was ever a competition between us. What, my, one of the ingredients I think I didn't mention before for being a good uh, surgeon, in fact, being a good, being good at anything, I think is having a good partner. And I, my husband has been my rock. I think he has certainly been, uh, I remember during MTAS, I said before that if I wasn't a surgeon, I wouldn't be a doctor. When MTAS happened and we were all wondering about where we would get post, my husband said to me, if you don't get a post in the UK, we will move. And he didn't mind that if I wanted to be a surgeon, I would have to move to a different country and he would just move. He would move to wherever it was I was gonna to go to, to be a surgeon because he knew that's how much, how committed I was to becoming a surgeon. And similarly, he, he has, so when he became a consultant, I was incredibly pleased for him. I don't, I think we always knew we'd have different tra tra trajectories in how we do things. It was a little bit, so now when I think back, I remember the day before finals, I was there like studying and my husband was off playing football. So <laughs> the fact that he's now been a consultant eight years, hmm, I wonder who, <laughs> clearly he's made some wiser choices than I have. Um, but yeah, it's not something that I've ever found to be a problem, no. Maybe I should, maybe I should be more upset about it. <laughs> Okay, um, so thank you for that. I'm um, just following up from um, what you all said, I, if I'm correct, do you all have partners that are also um, either surgeons or doctors? Um, do you think that's a benefit? Or do you think it makes things easier? So, so Sarika, I think um, finding someone that you want to be with is actually quite tough. And whoever that is, you just need to grasp it because that opportunity doesn't come recurrently. All right. So I think you have two or three opportunities in your entire lifetime to make, to, to find the right person. And um, it doesn't matter what background they are. It doesn't matter who they are. If they're the person that you want to be with, you should be with them. Um, the fact that we've all got medical partners and also have also had two children isn't the magic formula, I can promise you. So Vic Pengler, who is a colorectal trainee um, and is also a, she's the youngest uh, member of college council and is absolutely amazing. She's just had her fifth, um, you know, and we've got colleagues who've got lots more children. Um, and... Um, Oh my God, partners come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, jobs. And uh, so Scarlett McNally, who's also a Royal College, of Scar um, a college member, um, her husband's absolutely not medical and is the man who stays at home and is the, the house husband. And it just works perfectly. Um, so in my mind, there's no magic formula. Sarika, you just need to find the right person at the right time and just get on with it. Um, one other thing I would say is in terms of family balance, it, it's not just the kids, it's also being able to manage your relationship with your husband and um, like Miss Vic, we've been together I think 19 years or something, something quite a long time um, and to be able to keep a marriage going in, I know some of you are probably too young for this, so probably, uh, but to keep that relationship going is it does take work. So you need to put time and effort into that as much. Surgery as a as a career has probably one of the most notorious for relationships falling apart. Uh, you spend a lot of time at work, less time at home, and you if you do want to continue to keep that going, you need to even simple things like watching Netflix together or, or finding someone who you share very similar values with is probably very important so that as you grow, you grow together and those values stay and you appreciate the same things. 
So my husband and I, we, he, he loves cooking. I like eating, it works very well. But if you find things that you have in common, I think, and you have to make sure you nurture that. You have to make sure you give time to that, the same as you would your children. It's a, a big part of who you are and you want to make sure that it tr thrives just as every other part of you thrives. Yeah, I mean, I haven't got anything to add. I would just very much um, support what Vasha and, and Miss Vig have said. It's just about finding the right person, the person that, you know, makes you better, supports you, you know, wants you to do well. I think, you know, all those things make make such a difference. Um, and, you know, if you find someone and you're lucky enough to find someone like that, then, you know, grab them with both hands and, you know, go for it. It doesn't matter. As Miss Vig said, it doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter if they're a medic, a surgeon, you know, non-medic. Um, there's people that have got, you know, partners that do all sorts of professions and they just make it work and it's because they're the right person for them. So it's all about finding the right person. Um, yeah. OK, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think with that, then we'll move on to our last section, which is our general advice and success. Um, so if I could open this question to all panelists, what are the biggest challenges of pursuing surgery and what advice do you have so that we can overcome these? So Sarika, I'm gonna ask, um, I, I will answer that, but I'm gonna ask a favor. So there's lots of people on this call and I'm not hearing very many questions. So my ask is that while we answer this question, I want to know from them, what is it that they think will stop them from being successful? So what are they anxious about? What are they worried about? And can I have children and can I have a family? Can't be those questions. All right, so I want to know what else is it that makes people worry that means that we have to answer the questions. So, um, so and we're gonna need um, at least 10 questions, Sarika, in the, in the chat group. So just putting it out there. So um, I think for success, as I say, bottom line is you've got to want to do it. You have to be organized um, because if you're organized to do it, so it doesn't matter if you're sitting here as a final year medical student or a first year thinking I wanna do surgery. And if you're a final year thinking, gosh, I've left it too late to make a decision to do surgery, it doesn't make any difference. What you've got to be, what you've got to do is be organized and play by the rules. All right, and the rules now are much easier to access than they were in my day. All right, so you know how many papers you've got to get. You've got person specifications that tell you what to do. There are fantastic surgical societies that, that help you with what you do. And the mentorship programs through the surgical societies are absolutely phenomenal. So success, I think for me is um, wanting to do it and being organized. But Vasha, Nina, what do you think? Um. I think very much exactly what you've just said, Ms. Vig. Um, I think uh, something else which I, I would hope that I am doing and that maybe I would like to promote is have a mentor. I think, um, for example, when I was going through the whole pregnancy thing, Ms. Vig was very much there telling me that you're allowed to take your 12 months and you're allowed to not work um, on calls during your pregnancy and things like that. So when I moved on to my next job and I had a pregnant colleague, I said, hey, guess what? These are the things you can do and don't let anyone tell you you can't. Go and get them done. Make sure you, you are allowed to do these things. So throughout my career, I think one of the things I would like to do is paying it forward, making sure that I motivate people who um, are coming through, through me as trainees, uh, teaching and sharing knowledge. I think the, the more you share, the better you get as a person. Uh, perhaps my most sort of guiding thing is trying to be a good person if you're a good person I think most things tend to fall in place um, you become a better surgeon you become a better mom a better wife a better if you aim to do the right thing most of the time I think it tends to help it tends to be a good compass to hold your life against um, being honest being honest is I, having integrity and honesty is very important in being a good doctor uh, not only in surgery, in any field of medicine, having um, the uh, bravery or ha having the um, ability to be honest with yourself is very, very important. Be kind, be kind to yourself, be kind to others. Um, and 
one thing that maybe differentiates surgery from the other aspects of medicine is being able to make decisions quite quickly. I'm, two weeks ago, I was on call. I was doing a, I was just taking my trainee, my SHO through an appendectomy, and there was bleeding. There was quite a lot of bleeding, and she was having difficulty managing it. And I, I said, I think I'm going to have to take over. And at this point, there was a lot more blood, and you could feel everyone's eyes are on you, and you have to just manage. And being able to manage that quite calmly. I remember one of my consultants previously told me when when everything is going when there's chaos you have to be like a swan so on the outside you have to be very serene although inside your heart might be going but the swan are underwater the legs are like and you have to be like that so on the inside you might be quite stressed out but being able to ma manage that quite calmly is quite important as a surgeon i don't i think or a, as a leader and you will eventually be leaders or all of you will be leaders in your own field and being able to understand how to manage your emotions quite early on um, it's very, very important, I think. Uh, so, yeah, from my perspective, I think I would just echo what um, Vasha and Miss Vig have said about finding a mentor. And there's some really good mentoring schemes out there. We've already discussed the one at UCL for the WINS. Um, uh, the women in ENT surgery actually run their own mentoring scheme as well. And I'm sure there's lots of others out there as well. I mean, a mentor doesn't necessarily have to come from one of these schemes. You know, it could be that somebody you meet on placement, uh, you you know, you form a good relationship with um, and that you feel that you can talk to them. You know, I think most surgeons, whether they're male or female, um, will always try to help train, uh, you know, medical students and, and trainees if they come to them with questions and, you know, just wanting to find out more about a surgical career. So don't ever be afraid to approach people. I think sometimes perhaps as medical students, you maybe feel, well, um, perhaps as an outsider on some of the placements that you're on when you go to these, um, when you're in hospital, uh, hopefully people will actively try to get you involved and make you feel, you know, a part of the team. Um, but, you know, don't don't be afraid to, to approach people, whether that's one of the, the registrars, one of the, the other junior doctors or one of the consultants, because once you start asking questions, you know, people will see that you're interested and they'll be really, really keen uh, to encourage you and uh, to answer any questions that you have about the job and, you know, work life balance and, and, and anything else that you want to ask. So, yeah, definitely finding a mentor is, is one of the things that I would encourage all of you to do. Um, I think um, we've all sort of said and we've we've touched on the fact that um, a career in surgery and especially in terms of the training from from medical school all the way through to becoming a consultant is 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 a long haul you know um, so think of it as as not it, I think you've got to pace yourself you, you know it's 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 about working hard and it's about you know, endurance and you know having uh, you know you do push yourself and you know most of you will probably push yourself of all the time you know even as students you know there's always the exam to do or you know um uh, uh you know another piece of work that you need to hand in and things like that so it is always like that and it's like that throughout surgical training as well but it's about pacing yourself and and giving yourself a break like um um Vasha and Miss Vig have already touched on you know self-care is important as well um so it's it's a marathon it's not a sprint um is what I'm trying to say so you know just just be in it for the long haul, work hard, um, but give yourself a break when you need to as well. And I think um, the other thing is, is, is having interests outside of surgery. So we've, you know, we've, we've spoken about surgery and the fact that, you know, you're in work a lot and it, it, and the most of the time that you spend in your, you know, working day will be in hospital and will be at work, but it's really important when you do have any free time to make the most of that and do other things that you enjoy, you know, whether that's sport, whether that's reading, cooking, whatever it is, um, I think it's really important to have outside interests because it, it just gives you that balance and gives you that outlet to, to um, experience other things and um, take a break as well. Okay, great, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Miss Vig, we opened the chat to all our um, attendees and um, asked them, as you said, about uh, some of their worries or some of their maybe misconceptions about surgery. So um, some of the things we got back was that um, my biggest concern about a career in surgery as a woman is burnout through feeling like I constantly have to overachieve to be seen. Um, do you think that's true or are there any other comments? So I think if you uh, put yourselves back into, so who was before me, people like Avril Mansfield, there are huge champions 
who've paved the way for me. I think if you ask them that conversation, the answer is yes. Um, part of, there are many people who've got what we call surgical personalities, which isn't really a thing because people are so different, but um, there are people who just want to see rapid results, want to do practical things with their hands. Um, because of that, you will always take the opportunity to pick up a paper and, and all the other bits that you need to do. And it's up to you whether you do the bare minimum, which gets you to where you want to be, or you try and do it, you know, so even with surgical training now, surgical training is, um, is you know, six years post um, core level. Well, if you want to, you can actually do that in four years because you can push your competencies and work really hard to achieve them. It's up to you what you need to do. I think the, the landscape that you guys are working in is very, very different. So um, although it frustrates me, you know, a trainee who is um, going to do a night on call now no longer does the day and actually doesn't do the day after. Now that's very different to when I started in 1991 where I was doing a one in two on call. Um, and I loved it, but that's the way I was brought up. And I find it intriguing and very curious that people now are doing the hours that they're doing. But those hours work as long as we provide training in the hours that the trainees are at work. All right, it's not about service. So it's about us creating the environments in which people can flourish and that people don't feel burnt out. And right now, if you talk to surgical trainees right now with COVID, and again, Basha, Nina, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. And actually, of the students on the call, because you've, you know, the final years have been working in COVID wards as well. You know, people are tired. People are feeling burnt out now. And that's not because of surgery. That's because of um, all the things that we're doing. So the, the breaks and the pauses and, you know, Nina, what you talked about, the, the need to look after yourself is is not just COVID, it is the way of the future. Um, I know that normally I have a holiday, um, I normally take a couple of weeks off uh, in the summer, I take a week off in October and I used to take February half term off and just you know have those breaks and it didn't matter whether I was away or not. And when I haven't had them, I'm really ratty. So not having had a break at all since last April and working at the pace I'm, I'm at, I'm exhausted. But am I burnt out? No, I'm not. I've got loads of things I want to do because I enjoy going to work. So I think, guys, don't don't worry about the burnout conversation. It's the same conversation I'm going to have about don't worry about having children. You're not going to believe it until you're actually in it. But they're not entities. OK, great. Um we have a few more questions as well, so I will just list them out and then um, if any of our panelists want to comment on them, um, please feel free. So, um, like I said, we were sent some more comments from our attendees about what they're worried about. And this includes imposter syndrome, not having the right personality for surgery, surgery being too competitive and not being able to have equal opportunities and um, worries about their age. So either being too young or too old and that um, having a consequence on them not being taken seriously. Um, I think imposter syndrome perhaps we did touch on a little while earlier and I think a lot of that is having confidence and believing in yourself um, it's going to I, I don't know for me I think it's I remember when I graduated from med school and I graduated quite well with like prizes distinctions honors and then I went to med I went to be my like first day of being a doctor and I was like, I have no idea how anything works. I'm going to be a terrible doctor. I think that's going to be true. And every, every time you move up a stage, you're going to find that. You're going to find that you you have, the, the reason you're there is to train and to learn. So you have to fill the boots you've been given. And that's going to happen throughout. Um, the better, the more confident you are, the, the, the more skills and knowledge you gain as you go along, You that, that will start to fade away. But I don't think you're, training as such stops as soon as you become a consultant you continue learning it's a no matter what you do you, life is very much a lifelong learning process so you if you as long as you accept that and you know that you're going to keep learning and doing better your imposter syndrome should hopefully should not preclude you becoming a better you um, it's actually a helpful thing to have imposter syndrome because it's what drives many people to get better at what, what they do uh, as long as it's not so severe that it's stopping you progressing um, and the other thing about how but 
managing everything at the same time. It's not always going to be easy to have all, I mean, I, we've maybe painted a fairly, you've got Nina and Ms. Baker both you know, doing incredibly well, but maybe we need to, it, it's not all roses. Sometimes it is difficult. Sometimes we do let balls slip and it's not, um, it's not always easy. I mean, you can see my, my clock has got the wrong time and I think it's been like that for two months. So there are things that we've, I've let slip um, and I, I know that I can't hold everything in place. We've got laundry that needs to be done and, but it's knowing what's important and when it's important and recognizing that you, as long as you've got the important, I'm not sure if you may have seen this video about this professor who puts the big rocks at the bottom and then the little rocks fill in in between. As long as you've got your big rocks in place, your family, your career, your, um, your integrity, I think these things, if, as long as you've got these things in place, the other things will fall in place. You will find that your life is, it, it will find its way. Um, going back to the burnout question, I think as lot, for me personally, I've enjoyed my training at every stage. I may have taken the more scenic route by taking a year out for maternity each time and PhD in Dazi, it means I've taken a very long training route, but it doesn't bother me because I've actually enjoyed my training from the time I started. At no point have I thought, oh, I'm, I'm dreading, I wish I could find you know, a way out or I wish I, was, I had another option. Um, I've actually, I've enjoyed training throughout. I've enjoyed being a surgeon throughout. And if you can find that, if you can find the inner level of um, uh, peace or contentment, I think it's unlikely you'll get burnout. And if you find that you're getting quite exhausted or tired, take a step back, give yourself a break and then come back to it. And if I may just go back to Vasha, the, the conversation about the imposter syndrome. Nina, you talked about unconscious bias. And, you know, we talk about unconscious bias in the systems that we work in. But remember, there are unconscious biases that we hold ourselves. So depending on, and this is not a generalism, depending on the community that you've been brought up in, um, the way that the uh, paternal or maternal um, hold is within the, in the house that you live in, that you've been brought up in, um, it is quite often, it's quite common for um, Asian children to actually feel underconfident mm. because we, um, we're taught to be deferential. You know, we touch the, the feet of our, of our grandparents and, and you know, the, the elders. Um, we are taught to listen to them and be respectful. And we're brought up with, um, there's something that is therefore beholden in us which works in our personal lives, but actually comes across in our professional lives. Now you can't generalize because people come from very, very different backgrounds. But remember when you start talking about imposter syndrome and not feeling confident, sometimes it's due to the way that you are. Mm -hmm. And it's about how do you, Basha, you said it beautifully earlier, you know, how do you, how do you perceive yourself and what, what is the, the uh, aura that you're putting out about you to others? You know, and, and those are all things that are learned. You can learn those. You can learn public speaking. Um, you know, lots of um, motivational um, books and biographies talk about, you know, fake it till you be it. And, and do you know what? That's so true. You just have to put your shoulders up and get on with it. Um, and uh, sadly, Richard Branson, who, you know, I, I'm, not that I'm putting him on a pedestal, but Richard Branson actually said, if someone actually ever asks you to do a job, get on and do it, because if they didn't think you could do it, they wouldn't ask you. Um, so I think, I also remember, look into yourselves as well. What unconscious biases do you hold that actually you can improve to? But Nina, I stopped. So I interrupted. I'll, let me hand over to you. No, no, not at all. I mean, I was just going to, I was going to actually just touch on the fact that I think somebody in the chat um, Sarika, you mentioned that, that they'd mentioned about asking them the surgical personality. Um, I think, you know, this is one of those uh, old, old sort of held concepts that, you know, this type A surgical personality exists. And I think to some extent, you know, we've probably all got elements of this sort of so-called surgical personality um, that I don't think you need to have, have a certain way about you to become a surgeon I think the most important thing really is having that interest there and wanting to do it you know I don't think 
that your personality has to fit in with what people perceive to be a, a surgeon. I think if you're interested in it, go for it and just be yourself. Um, you know, I, I, I think that things are changing. I think that, you know, it is becoming a more, um, things are becoming a bit more open. You know, there are lots of different people from different backgrounds going into surgery, um, which should be celebrated. And, you know, all these people will bring their own elements and personality and skills uh, to the specialty. Um, and it's something that, you know, we should all be, um, you know, working towards, not thinking that actually, well, you know, this person, they they, they don't really fit the, the surgical personality. I don't think they should be a surgeon. No, you know, they should go and do something else. I don't think it should be like that. And I think slowly things are changing. Perhaps, you know, back in the day, it wasn't like that. And, you know, all these people have worked really hard for us to get to where we are now. And, you know, so don't let, let those kind of old school perceptions, as it were, hold you back from doing something that you want to do. Because, you know, once you're in there, uh, you'll do your best, you'll try hard and you'll make it work um, regardless of, you know, what your personality is like and whether you hold these so-called surgical traits or not. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so moving on, uh, one of the next questions we have is, do you think that your male colleagues or our male colleagues, what do you think they can do to support kind of us? in surgery, or if we do have difficulties, if we encounter difficulties during our surgical training, do you think that they can help in any way? I think I think the, um, I think probably as I've gone through my career, there've been more men that have supported me than women. Um, and there is a trait of, there is a, it's a small fraction, but they definitely exist of women who absolutely do not help uh, their colleagues to climb. And, and there's, you know, the conversation about lift as you climb is so important. Um, Basha, you touched on it earlier, making sure you open the doors to others. And, and Nina, you said the same, you know, you know, how do we make sure that people follow in our footsteps? Um, and, and there's, you know, I think there's also a quote that says there's a place in hell for those kind of women as well, which I absolutely feel is, is the right place for them. Um, but um, no, the men, to be honest, if we're going to change what we're doing, we need to get the men involved in what we are doing. Um, because they're the ones that are going to open the doors for us because they are in positions of leadership at the minute. And, and therefore, they have to be the first to open the door and welcome us in. So, but Anisha, I, I think there are lots and lots of people out there to support you. Um, again, Dasha, Nina, I don't know how you feel. Um, I also think if you need help, ask for help. Don't assume that if, for example, when I needed this couple of weeks off to help my son through his exams, I didn't just say, I need annual leave. I went down and spoke to Mr. My, my boss and I said, my son's got this really big exam. I'm really worried about it. And he was like, he'll be fine. I said, well, I need to be there for those few weeks. And I kind of painted out what I needed to do and what, what exams he had. So I involved him in my, in my process of getting this, this time off. And then he was like, you need to be there to help him write the essays. And I was like, I'm going to ask for leave. So he kind of got in, he, he probably said to me that I need to take time off. So involve people and um, don't think that people don't want to know. The more people know, the more interested they are in what's going on, the more likely you are to get help. Mm -hmm. um, and I did the same when I went to get the rotor coordinator because they don't give, during COVID, it was hard to get a block of leave off. Um, but because she was then invested in what I was doing, um, she, even on the day of the exam, she's like, how did it go? And I said, like, yeah, it went well. But it was, it's, the more people are involved in you, the more they get to know you, um, get, your, get yourself out, the more likely you are to get help. And I think that's probably true for anything you do, not only in surgery, mm -hmm. whether or not they're male or female. I must say that both the times I mentioned before where there were male colleagues who weren't particularly supportive, they were both Asian men. Um, so I think sometimes it's the people that you look to to help that might not always be the most helpful, uh, perhaps for the same reasons that we've got some cultural issues sometimes within Asian communities. Um, and if we start there and make sure that the people around us are first informed of the kind of help we need, that perhaps helps. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna add that I think that 
um, we've got to remember that actually our male colleagues um, may also have families and children of their own. So I think they do have a little bit more of an understanding than we sometimes give them credit for. Um, you know, they'll also have a partner that, that may or may not be working. So, you know, they'll know about the juggles and the things that you face. So I think asking for help is is always a good thing. And, and like Vasha said, you need to talk to these people, you know, don't try and fight the battle on your own. If you've got issues and things and speak to your colleagues, male or female. Um, as Miss Big said, I think some of as some of the um, the people that have been quite instrumental in my career have been male, and they've been male mentors that have really inspired me and and helped me along uh, along in my training. So, um, you know, mentors don't have to be female. Just as a female surgeon, some of the men actually can can really help and and um, guide you if you're having any difficulties. Um, in terms of advice for um, for men, um, I mean, I think that, you know, um, they need to, they need to, um, if they don't understand what's going on, um, then they won't be able to help you. So I think, um, you know, listen to your female colleagues, um, listen to, you know, um, what they're saying and, and if they need some help, be flexible. I think flexibility is a really big help. So um, in jobs that I've had where perhaps I've needed to juggle my rotor and things like that, actually, um, it's often been my male colleagues that have helped with that um, because I've spoken to them, they've understood that the, the, the problems that I'm having and that, that I need to move things around. Uh, you know, they've been willing to swap on calls and things like that. And, um, you know, I think, um, as much as um, we're trying to sort of fight this battle as, as, as women in surgery, actually, the, the men are helping and I, and, and I think they do recognise and, and if they're not, then, you know, inform them and tell them where they can help. And, you know, they might they might look differently at it and, and realise actually, oh, yeah, that's fine. You know, we can help. We can do this. Um, we can be more flexible and adaptable if it's going to make your life easier. Um, so just ask and, and communicate. I think it comes back down to communication. Um, with our colleagues and, and with our male counterparts um, and making them realize what we're going through and you know they might be going through similar things as well so so i think talking is important thank you um so i think we have a few final questions left um so how do you think that encouraging more women to pursue a surgical career can influence the field of surgery loaded question <laughs> I think a lot of times we equate certain personalities with certain personality traits. So, 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 so each gender with certain personality traits. So we think of women as maybe being having a soft touch, maybe being able to communicate with patients um, differently from how, how the men do. Obviously, these are very generalized sort of comments to make, and it may not be true for all men or all women. But I do think women sometimes do lend certain qualities differently than men would. We may approach problem solving differently than men would. Um, I think the whole female and male brain thing has been looked at um, with a lot of different by neuroscientists throughout time for the last, I think, 60, 70 years, certainly. And we, we do look at things differently. Um, I think for that reason, having that new um, perspective definitely will help in surgery. Uh, a lot of managing and medicine is problem solving. If you can problem solve differently, having people who look at things differently and not everyone being people like us. Um, and this, if you have different groups of people like us, you get to approach a problem and I think solve things far more efficiently. So I think for that reason, that definitely having more women is helpful. Um, we communicate differently and we're also perhaps slightly more organized. I, I certainly feel that <laughs> having a male and female uh, house officer makes a huge difference sometimes. <laughs> slightly unfair comment, maybe. Retract, retract, this is recorded. <laughs> I think the other thing, just on a very practical um, frame is if you look at the number of medical students going into universities, if we don't have women in surgery, surgery are not gonna have bums on seats, which makes the workforce really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and so actually having, you know, a full rotor rather than an unfull rotor makes a huge difference to training and service and morale and everything else, just, you know, just at really junior grades. Um, and Vash, I don't think you should retract that statement, I, I, you know, I am desperate to have a female surgeon 
uh, in the general surgery ranks at Croydon because I can't get the boys to organize themselves whatsoever. Um, and um, they're, you know, the, the mix is so healthy, you know, I wouldn't want to go to a party that only had men in it. I, I quite like the diversity of, of conversation that is, uh, you know, true, true diversity, which is multicultural, multicultural, multigender, you know, it, it makes such a rich environment. And that's the organisations we should be working in. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So a popular question that's coming from the audience is, what would your advice be for someone who's unsure about surgery? Try it. You have to try it. I think when I was trying to decide what I wanted to do at school, when I finished my Malaysian version of GCSEs, my dad arranged for me to spend a bit of time with different people. So people he knew. So I had some time with an engineer, um, a solicitor and a surgeon. And the only person who spoke to me was the surgeon. Uh, the solicitor and engineer both kind of nodded at me and pointed me towards something. And I was 16, 17 years old. But the surgeon actually interacted with me and showed me how to do a colonoscopy of all things. Um, and I found, and that was probably one reason why I went into surgery, because I found the I found the person, the persona of surgery, so much more attractive than the other career options. Um, and in retrospect, I wonder whether if the engineer had spoken to me, maybe I wouldn't be sat here at all. Um, but I think if you try it, and you also need to have a more global view than um, perhaps I had at that time, you need to understand, if you can, what your life may be like, or project a bit more to what your life may be like in the future, in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Uh, and I, I didn't have that opportunity, I didn't have that foresight when I was um, looking for career training. And I just went into doing something which I thought I might enjoy. And lucky for me, I did. But I, I sometimes do wish I had looked at it with a bit more globality, a bit more broadness before I decided. And I think that's an important thing to do. And now that you have people that you can talk to, I mean, certainly I'm happy for any of you to contact me directly if you want to talk through things. Um, and you have these access and options now. So speak to people who you think you, you can get information from and do a little trial. I wanted to do transplant. I did a week's trial to see whether it would suit me. It's useful to do these things. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with what Fasha said. You have to you have to try it. And, um, you know, just like you do work experience at school, you know, at medical school, go and try different specialties, whatever you're interested in. If you're unsure, then, you know, just go and try them out. Most people are very welcoming. Um, I certainly make you know, really big efforts with any medical students I come into contact with because I really want to inspire them to go into the best surgical specialty, which is ENT, of course. So, um, you know, I do I do really try. And, um, you know, anybody that's interested, <clears throat> we can always organise time for you to, I know it's all COVID dependent at the moment, but normally, you know, you can always come along to clinic, you can always come along to theatre, come and experience it and see see what you think, ask questions um, and get involved really. Um, and that's the, I think that's the best advice that we could give you really, if you're, if you're unsure at all, just reach out and I'm sure people will be more than willing to help you. And, and you know, I think if you're unsure, the, the, the conversations start to live in the surgical world. So whether you're unsure or not, you know, or confident, you should have a portfolio that you've already started to, you know, some the portfolio sitting on your desk, which is how you're going to progress your surgical career. You start putting in there the world of surgical audits or a bit of surgical research or a case report or the fact you've been on a suturing course or you've done surgical teaching or you've gone and taught at your old school that you worked at before. All of those are elements of a surgical career. And once you're in that surgical world, you can make a decision whether you like it or not. But that also then allows you to put in the evidence that you need that shows that you want to be a surgeon, which means that you'll then succeed because you'll be ahead of the game. So I think, yeah, you've got to try it, but guys, try it and make sure the evidence goes in. So if you do do a taster week, you know, reflect on it. What is it that you saw? What is it that you learned? Put it down as a document in your portfolio. So it counts as evidence as you go through. If you go to theatre, anything you've assisted in, anything you've seen in the emergency department, stick it into your e-logbook, it's free. Start adding to your e-logbook right from the very beginning. But start imagining yourself as a surgeon. And if the, if the, you know, if the mask fits, get on with it. 
If it doesn't, go and do something else. There are so many things in life. But it's quite interesting, Basha. So lawyer, doctor, or engineer. You see, there are only three choices. <laughs> no. Having said that, the rest of my family have got very interesting options. Like they all have very interesting jobs. <laughs> And the other thing I would say is have other interests. I know Nina mentioned this before, but I think that's so important. I think the the dates I'm really stressed out, I paint or I do other things. I love fashion. I, I like clothes. I, I do all these things. And I think it helps me be a better version of me. Um, I teach drama. I do stand up. I, the, if, you don't, if I don't do these things, I feel myself getting frustrated. I think that's when I'll probably get burnout. So you need to do, you need to get yourself out and do the things that you enjoy that makes your heart fly. If you feel that kind of happiness in surgery, you need to find something outside of it and they'll balance each other out. But you need to do that. Don't be embarrassed of the things you like, even if it's not the same as the old boys club. If you want to wear a pink dress to work, wear your pink dress to work. We do. And guys, okay, I can tell you, once you start looking at surgical portfolios at, you know, a core surgical training or higher, Honestly, everyone's got the same. Everyone's done the basic surgical skills course, the CRISP, the ATLS. Everyone's got, you know, a foundation certificate, say you've signed off. What's really, really interesting, honestly, what I do when I get portfolios, I, I look at all of that stuff because, yeah, it's very interesting. And then I always go to the very back to see what else you've done. Um, and I, I kid you not, the majority of you can't have climbed Everest or Kilimanjaro or, oh, God, you've done amazing stuff, raised huge amounts of money for charity. You're doing incredible stuff that wasn't even on our radars when I was going through training um, so remember you are fantastic individuals and if you want to do surgery um, you really should not be underestimating the ability to do it you, you can all do it yeah the skills you will learn the skills are not the thing that's going to determine whether or not you'd be a good surgeon the the skills you will learn the skills everyone will learn the same as you can drive okay great so just to finish up our final final question um if not surgery what other career could you see yourself doing i would have gone into some kind of business i would have made loads and loads of money <laughs> yeah guys don't don't do surgery for the money if you think if anyone thinks on this call that you do surgery and you make huge amounts of money in the private sector think again it's old school that's definitely old school there are there are probably 20 surgeons in the entire country that make multi-millions uh, not multi-millions no one makes multi-millions you know comes up with you know probably a three-figure salary based on their private there may be one or two work in harley street who do you know um you know stuff for saudi and whatever who make huge amounts of money but literally count them on fingers and toes that that's it so you cannot go into surgery for money but yeah no I, I, if I hadn't done surgery I think I probably would have gone into business and I know I would have been a multi-millionaire <laughs> but sadly I'm not <laughs> I think I would have done something creative um I would have loved to gone into fashion or like um art or TV or something like that. I've always loved um, the arts, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I hadn't, if I hadn't done medicine, I hadn't done surgery. The only other passion that I really had was languages when I was at school. So probably would have been something related to that. So something completely different um, to surgery. Mm -hmm.